Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again, and in this video we're taking back the rails, a companion series to Taking Back the Streets, where we investigate the idea of requisitioning existing rail rights of way for the purpose of high speed rail. With their powers combined, they form Taking Back the Series, which you'll continue to see more of in the future. To kick off this sub-series, we'll begin in Chicago, Illinois with a classic passenger rail route, the Milwaukee Road Hiawatha route between Chicago and Milwaukee. We're starting off at Chicago Union Station, which is the fourth busiest train station in the United States. Chicago Union's platforms are below street level and the tracks are covered by parks and buildings until emerging into daylight six blocks north of the station. After a slow speed curve, there are several at-grade crossings that will keep things slow on the Chicago and Milwaukee subdivision route. On the way to joining Union Pacific tracks in a broad right-of-way containing eight tracks, let's talk about the ideas behind this series. Here we will assume control of rail as needed to facilitate high-speed passenger rail. The obstacles to high-speed rail will be ignored along existing rail rights-of-way to see what could result if intercity passenger rail were made a priority over freight. This is to facilitate investigating what might be gained from radical ideas like nationalization of rail rights-of-way or mandated electrification. However, this video is not meant to advocate for those alternatives. Like my other videos, my main aim is to look a little deeper at an idea rather than simply shout slogans. The goal is to imagine that these radical ideas are indeed the case. Would the result for passenger rail be Eden, or would it be somewhat underwhelming considering the trade-offs that would need to be made by deprioritizing freight? So far through Chicago, it is underwhelming as this route is limited here by slow speed curves, grade crossings, and an intersection with Union Pacific tracks. It's possible this could be improved, but for my base case, I'm going to look at what the geometry and layout of the existing route can bear. After that, we'll talk about how the existing right-of-way might be altered for quicker trips. One thing that also needs to be considered is regional and commuter rail because this portion of the route is owned and operated by Metra, which provides these services for the Chicago metro area. We'll pass many Metra stations that would likely complicate any line improvement plan based solely on speed. Speaking of Metra and speed, we will pass Metra's Grand Avenue facility and finally be able to speed up in a broad, potentially high-speed curve. Speed for now will be limited to 110 miles per hour due to some upcoming obstacles. Still close to downtown at 6 miles out, but clearly more suburban, we will come upon a couple of diamond crossings. From what I've been able to dig up, crossing diamonds at speed is possible with certain types of this intersection. However, high speed is not normal, so I'm keeping things at 110 miles per hour through here. You're going to find a lot of the route frustratingly limited like this for various reasons. One of those is plenty of at-grade road crossings. Here we have three in quick succession. To fix this, you would likely need to put the tracks in a trench but that creates a problem of how to retain the station here in the lower left-hand corner, especially considering through tracks for speed. Many areas along this route have ample room for four tracks, but making that work with a station and getting it past local opposition is another matter. This is just a bit further north, and I want to point out the continuing mix and match nature of grade separation through here. There just isn't a length long enough to gain and retain speed, and with the at-grade crossings, you're going to be restricted to 110 miles per hour, because more than that requires that the corridor be sealed from outside incursion. And here is the North Glenview Station as an example of one that does have plenty of room to accommodate four tracks to facilitate both high-speed intercity and local commuter rail. It's worth mentioning that at this point, this right-of-way isn't commonly used by freight. The condition for the route for the next 12 miles is pretty similar. Mix and match grade separation, 110 miles per hour, some metro stations to consider. That change is due to interaction with a couple of branch lines at grade here at Rondout, Illinois. 
North of here, the route is owned by Canadian Pacific Kansas City Limited. We don't care about that in this scenario, but one thing that does need to be considered is what to do with the freight traffic that currently uses this right of way. If you're talking about some sort of nationalization scheme, then there are other close by rights of way which could be expanded, leaving a passenger only right of way. If private ownership continues, that introduces a whole host of challenges. You're going to want to separate passenger and freight either spatially or temporally, and also the amount of tracks or sidings would need to be expanded to keep fast trains from getting hung up by slower ones. If traffic is so heavy that both need to run at the same time and place, then you're likely talking federal speed restrictions in the 90 to 110 mile per hour range. So it's really not as simple as taking back the rails. Just like putting a high speed train on one half of a freeway has obvious implications for road traffic. After crossing Atkinson Road at grade, the route has the geometry and grade separation to support high speed travel for about nine miles before needing to slow for a 125 mile per hour curve and an at grade crossing. Accelerating to 200 miles per hour and back would take up most of that, but I think about seven miles of 150 mile per hour cruise is reasonable. Unfortunately, this is the only high speed capable portion of the route as it stands. Though this route is quite straight for the most part, there is a curvy section in the middle near the border of Illinois and Wisconsin containing four sub 125 mile per hour curves. I still have this section as capable of 110 miles per hour, but it shows the consistency of one obstacle or another keeping a train at 110 miles per hour on this path. And I picked this one because it looked like one of the easier routes to start with. So something to think about in terms of the overall concept. The Union Pacific Milwaukee subdivision is straight through this section and only a mile east, but unfortunately there is no good way to get between the two at high speed. If you're not from the area, you might think it's mostly rural. However, that's only the case for about 15 miles. And even that is interrupted by Sturtevant, Wisconsin. That condition removes one more avenue for getting up to true high speed. And the route is also crossed at grade 13 times here. Back in suburban territory and we are approaching our only intermediate stop, Milwaukee Mitchell International Airport. This provides a nice additional airport option for the Chicago area and speed north of here is slower. So slowing for this station doesn't waste a tremendous amount of time. The current station is a pleasing prairie style design. I have added my Texas Central Railway style station model, which you could argue is a modern take on the theme. Since we're stopping, let's talk travel time. For these 78 and a half miles between Chicago Union Station and Milwaukee Mitchell International, I have a travel time of 46 minutes for an average of 102 miles per hour. The terminal here is a mile and a half from the station and it's served by a shuttle bus. Could be a better connection, but not bad. Now you may be thinking, hey, you're mostly going 110 miles per hour here and only did 150 for seven miles. Why bother with electrification? And you'd have a point. But first, let's get a little closer to Milwaukee. Now at 60 miles per hour, thanks to a slower curve and getting much slower shortly. I'm using electrification as a point of comparison for the options I'm going to give you in a minute that look more like high speed rail. A 125 mile per hour diesel electric would be about a minute slower here. However, it would require similar track work, so the cost would still be about two thirds as much. Back to the route and now entering a significantly slower approach into the Milwaukee Intermodal Station, which is unfortunately placed on the wrong side of Interstate 794 from downtown. However, bus and streetcar service between the two are accessible here. Now that we've made it to Milwaukee, let's check travel times again. Between Milwaukee Mitchell and Milwaukee Intermodal, it is seven and a half miles. I have this taking 10 minutes for an average of 45 miles per hour. 
That brings our Chicago Union to Milwaukee intermodal total to 86 miles. The existing grade separation and geometry is theoretically capable of accomplishing this in 58 minutes with the stop for an average of 89 miles per hour with a conventional high-speed rail train. By way of comparison, the old Milwaukee Road Hiawatha service took 75 minutes and current Amtrak service takes 90 minutes, both using the same route. Milwaukee Road having the same amount of stops, Amtrak with two more. For upgrades, I'm going to give two options. A cheaper version, this will grade separate what's practical and get the easiest possible section up to 200 miles per hour. A more expensive version, grade separation and adjust curves to faster speed when practical. With grade separation including this portion of right of way north of Deerfield, Illinois, a train could travel at 200 miles per hour for about 30 miles. I have grade separation on existing geometry yielding a potential travel time between Chicago Union and Milwaukee intermodal of 39 minutes with the stop at Milwaukee Mitchell for an average of 132 miles per hour. How much more can this easily be improved? Grade separation and practical curve adjustment yields about 50 miles of 200 mile per hour travel. I have that taking 36 minutes with the stop for an average of 143 miles per hour. Let's put all of these options next to each other and compare my estimated costs. By this metric, the diesel electric option seems to be the best, but this doesn't account for stimulation of ridership and the economy through increased efficiency, but this isn't an economics channel. One important consideration here is that this route has alternatives around it where freight could go if you wanted to create a dedicated passenger route here. Then it becomes about the politics of making that happen, which are near impossible at present, but who knows 20 or 40 years from now. I guess the overall point is that this produces good results for not a lot of money if something like this were done. And that's what this series is trying to present a clearer picture of. Which option is your favorite? For me, the diesel electric option is pretty intriguing, even though it's not super fast. But let me know what you think in the comments. Plenty more of your favorite channel series on the way and another Stu's News. This time on the last Monday of the month, April 29th. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you on that big beautiful freeway!